thank you very much. Um, so, well, four different approaches, four dedicated organization with different approaches, different business activities, but with open source as they are out. Um, I'd like to start with Corinne. Um, you are the CEO of a company which is a pure player of open source software, Can <laughs> I think. <laughs> Um, well, could you explain us why open source and uh, how you manage that on your strategy day to day? I'll try. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Well, yes, open source, just a short time on maybe some of you don't know PrestaShop yet. Uh, so PrestaShop is a software uh, company, 100% uh, software, 100% open source and 100% e-commerce. So it's a software dedicated to e-commerce. And our vision and mission uh, is to give every retailer, every merchant around the world uh, the, the opportunity to start and to succeed its online store, its online business. So nice vision. Um, and as uh, Talent explained a bit earlier, uh, if you want to fulfill this promise and this vision, this mission, you have to start international from the start, because every merchant around the world, that's every merchant around the world. And uh, you have to start open source. That's what our founder thought. Why? Because when e-commerce started and when the company started, so it was in nine years ago, um, there were millions, there are still millions of uh, e new small merchants, project owners who wanted to start in the e-commerce. There was basically no e-commerce except in the US. So open source was the easiest way to fulfill our vision, of course, to give this opportunity to anyone. So we did, and, and not only open source, but a very, uh, PrestaShop is well known for having a simple code, so accessible, to engineers and software developers and merchants who don't have high, uh, very high uh, software skills with very well-known languages like PHP and MySQL and so on. So all open source, uh, and in France, you know, uh, we have free open source means gratuit and, okay, we have that. Free software. Free software, not free. But we decided that in, fr in French, free would mean free also, <laughs> so we, we started and we still are a completely free uh, okay, software. So no dual licensing. No dual licensing. So where is the business model? Okay, that was the question you asked me when we uh, prepared this, uh, this uh, session. Uh, so at that time too, many open source businesses were roughly uh, managing their business as uh, professional services. That was the main uh, um, examples. Um, and uh, PrestaShop also kind of started with a dual business model, with wi the business model around these professional services. But if you want to grow internationally, running professional services from France needs, I don't know how much in financing, but much more than we could get. So, okay, so we started, but had to find something else. And the something else became uh, our main business model today, uh, which is uh, what you usually call a core open, meaning the software is for free. And the software is really for free, meaning you can really open a store for free. You don't, it's not a freemium, it's for free. But we have uh, thousands of modules, extensions, plugins, all these words are, are being used around it. So this is our business model today, it's like maybe 90% of the business model is around these modules, extensions, and the rest is some training and support. But we don't okay. try to develop the training and support, we try to develop only uh, the modules and extensions and plugins on our ma own marketplace. So it looks like a, a store, a Play Store, an App Store, not to name, uh, to name the, the main a one. A Presa Store. <laughs> um, and uh, we have uh, around 6,000 modules, uh, yeah, that's a lot uh, <laughs> to maintain. 
and we have a business model where we keep 30% and the contributors get 70%. So we have uh, several thousands contributors on this marketplace from literally all over the world, literally, like 200 countries, some stuff like that. So, And uh, what's nice about that model, um, there are also challenges, but what's nice is that, of course, if you are a merchant, I don't know, a word is very far from France, New Zealand, okay, at the opposite. Uh, and you want, you need for your online store the local e-payment system or the local uh, post office to deliver your, your, your parcels. We don't know these guys. Okay. But a local contributor will know these guys, work on the right extension and put it on the marketplace so every store in the world can really have a local store okay. and an international one. So that's the main business model. So modules are either for free, again, either paying modules. So why some are free, why some are paying? Some um, industry players, some industry partners, let's say uh, like PayPal, uh, wants to offer its module for free on our marketplace. So we allow them to, to offer that, that module for free. They do the support, they do the maintenance. Uh, but of course, we have a kind of partnership with them uh, to make them more visible on our marketplace as a free module. So that's mm -hmm. part of them, the modules. And the rest, the majority of them is paying and the range is, we try to make it not too expensive. So again, to fulfill our vision, anyone should be able to open and succeed an online store. So from 30, to a few hundred uh, euros, uh, is and the majority is under 100 euros per module. Okay, so w we can say that you are producing free software, but you are also contributing to create a community of free software uh, producers. Thousands of them. Thousands of them. And that's what Great. we are very proud of. And, and these guys are really uh, people, integrators, agencies, people who talk to us, people who just put their modules on the marketplace and then support them in the way they want to. Uh, so it's really a huge community, apart from the core software itself, where we have, of course, dozens of, of, uh, of uh, developers here on GitHub. And, and you places. have companies and also individuals that are contributing to the, to the code? Exactly, we have big companies like Google, who's doing its own module, of course, and the individual like people from the team who have their own modules on the on the marketplace also. So it's really a very, uh, it's a real genius uh, community, but it's very interesting and challenging because they all contribute to uh, to have uh, the most, probably one of the most extensive software for e-commerce due to that thousands of people saying, hey, in my country, you know, you have a, we have that famous marketplace, it's only here located in Brazil, so I'll do the module to allow merchants to work with that particular marketplace. And so that makes us one of the most extensive software on the, uh, in the world. And that's what's so interesting for us, apart from what, of course, previous uh, speakers have told uh, in being, and want we want to stick to this open source model, even if it's, if it's smaller, as you may imagine, than uh, bigger, bigger firms who are on prop proprietary model in e-commerce. Thank you. And Chris, perhaps uh, we, we talked about community. You are, uh, well, uh, directing uh, a large foundation, the Linux Foundation. Uh, what's your vision about these models, these free software models, uh, and the diversity you, well, I see you, you are facing every day, uh, uh, everywhere in the world? Yeah, um, I'll speak a little bit to uh, the Linux Foundation. So for uh, those who aren't aware what the Linux Foundation is, is it's, it's kind of the name's kind of a misnomer now because it's, it's really a, uh, a federation of foundations, right? So you have uh, the Node.js Foundation, Let's Encrypt, Cloud Native Computing, Open Container Initiative, Auto um, uh, AGL, which is auto Automotive Grade Linux, and so on. So, so, it's a, so it's a mix of foundations all operating under the um, Linux Foundation. So what we do um, as, as a foundation, essentially we enable 
companies to usually collaborate on a piece of software that they deem um, you know, uh, relevant to their business, right? And so they form kind of a sub-foundation, whether it's Node.js or Cloud Native Computing, which, which I helped lead, which was seeded with Google's Kubernetes, and they just agree to uh, the rules for participation. You know, here are the bylaws, here's how we behave, uh, and they store the IP um, in, inside this foundation to make sure there's kind of a firewall um, so they don't sue each other and all these other uh, lovely things that sometimes happen uh, in, in the business world. And our overall kind of um, view of, of how this works is, you know, there's this concept of, you know, there, there's, there's open source projects um, that eventually uh, produce, you know, code and um, companies take these projects and turn them into uh, products you know, that they uh, eventually sell, um, and eventually they make money, and they take that money and fund it back into the actual, um, you know, uh, development of said, um, you know, uh, projects, and so on. So it's kind of this virtuous cycle of, of uh, projects, products, and profits, and that's kind of how the Linux Foundation uh, operates uh, today. Okay, great. Um, Kevin, uh, well, Bloomberg is not uh, an IT company, uh, it's an information company. You are not producing, uh, well, you are not selling or making any money uh, with uh, open source, but open source is uh, also a, a way of building things for you? It is. Um, so actually, Igor's presentation uh, covered a lot of the same reasons that we're involved in a lot of open source projects. Um, Damn it. Bloom Bloomberg <laughs> has been around for 35 years. 35 years ago, while software was being shared, there was nobody had invented the term open source or free software or any of that yet. Um, so the company built what it needed to get the job done. Um, now the open source community has caught up. Uh, there are tools available that we can actually use to solve the problems that we need to solve. I'm not going to talk too much about those because I'm going to do that next. But, um, <laughs> but that has resulted in us now being able to collaborate on these projects because they are, let's say, 80 or 90 percent of the way towards what we might need to solve a problem that we have, which 10 years ago there was nothing outside of Bloomberg that would do those things. Um, in addition, since we also have thousands of engineers, we're creating things all the time, and for many of the same reasons he mentioned, we're beginning to publish uh, software so that people can see what our engineers build, we can give back to the community, and those are not pieces of software that, well, number one, they're obviously not strategic to our business for the same reasons he mentioned, but they're also not even directly related to our business. They're, they're just general tools that other users might find useful and beneficial, just like we did, um, and they could be used by anyone, our competitors or anybody else, to have the same kind of problems. So you're right, we're a, we are, you could call us a cloud company. Uh, we've been around since before there were cloud companies, but our product is something you access via software that connects to our network. We don't deliver things to your desk. Um, it's, it's all remote. Um, and so, yes, we're not a product company in that sense. Yeah, but uh, you, you are uh, at the uh, out of information and uh, we talked ev every day about uh, digital transformation. Digital transformation is about information and sharing yes. information. Uh, is there something um, different between sharing information and sharing software? Uh? Um, I would say there is. Um, it's the collaboration aspects primarily. Um, Data is... I mean, there is collaboration on data sets as well. Someone will, will publish a, say, a city, for example. It was one of the things we were talking about last night. We'll publish a, a large data set of maybe data that came from their public transit system. It's just raw data that shows all the trips that were taken and where all the buses went and what time they got there. And then someone else will come along and say, hey, wait, if I take that data and I overlay it on top of this other data, I can learn how you know, people in different parts of the city use the public transit system, and then they'll publish that. That ends up being an open project, just like open software, except mm. now it's open data. Yeah. Um, so we, much of the data that we gather and analyze and publish to our users um, is not what you would call open data. It arrives from sources that keep it protected for various reasons. It's, it's valuable to them for it to be contained and only delivered to, to certain people. So we ha much of what we work with isn't that way, but we are actually starting to participate more in open data initiatives. We've actually run events about open data and using data for social good and 
things along those lines too. Okay, uh, well, this event is about uh, uh, open source, but also open data and open innovation. Um, you just talked about uh, open data. Um, uh, is, is it some, some kind of uh, competition for you? Uh, all these people sharing information all the time? Um, and um, does it uh, change also your business model to, do, do you use open source and open approaches to adapt to the new business models? We do. Um, actually, for those of you who have read it, and I doubt there's anyone here who ever has, but there is a story that the founder, a book that the, st uh, the founder of the company wrote about what prompted him to write the company, or build the company in the first place, and it was exactly open data. Uh, he worked in an industry where certain types of data were only communicated via very cumbersome mechanisms and kept on the desks of the people who had them and no one could share them and if you wanted to find out the price of a particular thing you had to call someone and then what they told you may or may not actually have been the price. It might have been what they wanted to sell it to you for, not what it actually was available for. So the creation of the company was to solve that exact problem. This data exists, it should be readily available to everyone and transparent, so let's build a system to do that. So our system does that, although it's not free, obviously, it costs a lot of money to pay for all of the engineers to build these things and to operate the networks, but we don't charge for the data. The, the data is, it's, you know, in some cases, providers charge us to get access to the data, and we have to turn around and do that as well. But we're charging for making it easy to use, making it easy to analyze, giving you the tools to help you make better decisions. Um, so when we see useful new data sets come along, whether that might be maps or public transit data or whatever it is, and we can incorporate those into the analyses we're already doing, we do so and then contribute back to those too. Okay, great. Uh, LinkedIn, Igor. Uh, LinkedIn is uh, also f uh, an information company. Uh, you are sharing, you are connecting people, you are creating communities within LinkedIn. F uh, collaboration is at the heart of LinkedIn. Um, uh, certainly. Uh, similarly to um, a slightly different approach from Bloomberg, what we view is that the your, your network is actually acting as the filter of what interests you mm -hmm. and your let's say your industry acts as a fit of what is interesting in the industry, et cetera, et cetera. So the community then, um, through your network, provides you that information that would be actually relevant for you to be more productive and successful in your career. So certainly within it, we, we operate slightly different because we are in a very personal space and then privacy sort of overlaps with it. And in that situation, it's not open source in a sense of uh, free for all and available for all because we do have these privacy concerns. Everything that we do or want to do with the data has to have an explicit, in, uh, let's say our members need to agree to it explicitly. And that creates um, slightly different or difficulties in some places because there's some inconsistencies at times. Okay, uh, perhaps to, to be because we, we have four different approaches, but for example, we have different kinds of uh, strategies, open source at the heart of these strategies, and um, technologies that are quite similar because uh, you are uh, dealing with uh, information, you are sharing information, you are collecting data. Uh, would it be possible for uh, your different uh, companies, organization to, to, to team up, to work together, uh, to, to produce uh, and tackle uh, new, uh, new challenges? Uh, for example, Bloomberg and LinkedIn, for example, could uh, <laughs> build a, a, a new <laughs> and like empowering open innovation is uh, the, the, the motto of the Paris Open Source Summit. <laughs> uh, I can start on that one. Well, in the end, um, it's a lot of software. So um, software engineers collaborate all the time, whether they do it within the walls of a corporation, whether they don't do it within the world of a corporation, they do. And that's what, uh, what makes our profession so great. We're not really bound to any specific boundaries. Uh, we do act ethically and we do act uh, morally, as I, I would hope. <coughs> but um, collaboration is always there. Now, for example, to do something with Bloomberg would make sense from both angles of whether it fits our business values or business propositions uh, that we deliver to our members. Both from uh, Google's, uh, uh, sorry, Bloomberg's <laughs> perspective, sorry. <laughs> 
didn't mean that one. <laughs> uh, Bloomberg's perspective or from LinkedIn's perspective. Uh, we have a value that we bring to our member and you want to stay as close as possible to this so they would actually identify what is it that they can get by using our services. Same thing for Bloomberg. They're providing something to their members that's very true to their core values and visions, and vision and mission. And you don't want to diverge too much from it because then that brings noise too much. Okay. Trying to think of a concrete example where uh, I, th I think Bloomberg is collaborating with the Linux Foundation and the Core Infrastructure Initiative. I don't know how many people know what that is, but uh, uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of you have heard when uh, the Heartbleed SSL uh, bug yeah. came out. Those are those are some bad times for uh, for the poor sysadmins that had to do all the updates. But um, you know. We, we have this problem, uh, I think, in the industry around open source sustainability, right? So things like OpenSSL are incredibly, uh, you know, like depend, like, you know, all the companies that do any like financial transactions are pretty much dependent on this open source library, but no one explicitly funds the development of this. Really, OpenSSL was just, uh, you know, a couple people that were doing it part time, even though this is so important. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 almost, it's, it's like infrastructure, it's like roads, right? It's like, you know, like our taxes pay for the upkeep of infrastructure, but we don't have that. We don't have an anal anal analogous system uh, for open source yet. So one thing that we did um, in the Linux Foundation is we created something called the Core Infrastructure Initiative, or CII for short, which essentially um, gets a bunch of companies together. Uh, Bloomberg was, was an initial members, Google and some other folks uh, to basically uh, put together uh, a kind of a pot of money, almost like a trust, and use that money to fund um, these kind of common libraries that uh, everyone depends on um, and, and kind of make sure that they're sustained and the people that are working on them are properly uh, funded. So like OpenSSL has been one example, uh, NTPD, um, the, the, the date library, uh, surprise, if you surprised, like there's really no one maintaining that one and that one's pretty crucial. So, um, you know, just one example where companies are getting together to kind of fund um, you know, uh, important infrastructure in the internet that otherwise doesn't get kind of, kind of, kind of funded. You know, it's it's this typical like tragedy of the commons problem that happens. But yeah. I don't know if Kevin could speak more to that. Yeah, and that's that's really a um, sort of the maturation of open source. You know, it starts out as a bunch of people just writing things that they want to write and sharing them with other people, and then companies, large and small, see those tools and go, wow, that would be useful if we use that. And so then they do, and more companies use it, and it becomes more popular. And then you get to the point where it's on billions of machines, and it's protecting, I would guess, trillions of dollars or whatever currency you like of transactions around the world every day, and yet there are literally three people working on this software barely scraping by to keep it going. And so then suddenly it's it's just like, what if the air traffic control system was being maintained, the software that ran the air traffic control system was being maintained by four people? What would happen if suddenly someone found a serious flaw? This was exactly what happened. And so it, it is this sort of this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's come full circle, it's not quite that, but it is these tools have gotten to the point where they have displaced most of the other alternatives because they're better than all of those alternatives, but people didn't necessarily think about, well, what is, you know, if you, if you choose to purchase a product that does the same thing from a large company, and you are a company, you will do some analysis to determine what the long-term health of that vendor might be, so you know whether you're gonna, whether you're comfortable uh, hitching yourself to that wagon, as we might say in the United States. Um, but when it's an open source project, you can't do that. There is nothing to go vet to determine how, how, what the long-term health of that project is, and yet you're choosing it as a fundamental piece of the things that maybe protect your data. So that's been a very worthwhile effort that Chris mentioned, um, and collaboration amongst a large number of companies. Okay, great. Corinne? Yeah, OpenSSL is a great project, uh, <laughs> of course, uh, seen from uh, PrestaShop, and uh, I think you should do more and do even more advertising to find more people collaborating, yeah. and I'll ask my team if they have some spare time uh, <laughs> on, that, on that one, because it's really, uh, it, it, it's a great product, it's a great project. Uh, we've been trying it recently. Um, so, but it, it, the then the difference is, Who's going to make it uh, maybe uh, um, a company? Because uh, uh, then this is always a, a tricky one. It's a project, 
and can you make it a company and a healthy company because a company needs to be healthy to grow and uh, and be chosen by big companies and so on and so forth so now that's the, the, the kind of question that has never been easy to answer to. It starts like a nice project, and then who will or will won't make it maybe a, a, a product that can still, of course, be free and all that stuff. But And there's always that tricky difference between project com and product and company in the open source space, uh, which is a very exciting challenge I live every day. Uh, it takes hours, but this is still a question that has to be solved for each of these open source projects. Um, every uh, aspect we have uh, evoked uh, are based on, um, well, uh, internet, SaaS, cloud uh, strategies. Um, I think you are uh, on different aspects working on uh, cloud projects and uh, how the cloud is uh, changing the rules uh, for different companies. Do, do you contribute, uh, invest in uh, cloud strategies uh, to, to help you accelerate your digital strategies? Um, yes, of course. <coughs> um, when we started LinkedIn, there wasn't a cloud provider. And so we are actually leasing space and we're running our own data centers. If we had to start LinkedIn today, uh, we would certainly not take that route we would uh, probably host it completely within one of the big cloud providers and, um, and not having to run our own data centers. We just, I'm not too sure that it makes, um, because it, the cloud providers allows you to grow with your traffic and pay on demand what you need instead of uh, a provisioning in, in anticipation. Uh, and then what happens today is that at times we are investing whether something makes sense or not. Um, innovation or trying things out and it may be a much faster to to start that innovation with a cloud provider than within our own uh, uh, data center once we do that though there's um, uh, we need to be careful how data transits across and then uh, we've gone we've become very good into operating our own software cloud providers doesn't don't necessarily provide you that level of granularity that's one place where we at times struggle but we always take that approach, okay, what is it that, that's out there that we can try? And then we can figure out whether it works or not much faster if it's on the cloud and then coming back in or not. Well, I guess we are exploring the same, uh, same stuff. Uh, although we didn't have our own data center because we're too small for that. Uh, so we're exploring right now. Uh, we have a first uh, experience uh, trial going on uh, with uh, Microsoft a uh, company that you know quite well now, I guess. Um, we started to explore with them uh, nearly one year ago, and uh, that's also something that uh, Peter from Airbus mentioned, that uh, cloud is going to change a lot of stuff in the open source area, probably, because mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, of course, uh, it's a different business model. Also, it's, there's a tech challenge and a business model challenge, because SaaS is a SaaS service uh, you charge for. So the first trial we've been doing is the, on Azure with Microsoft. We have a kind of, uh, we developed a, f a great template to help people configure all the Azure, uh, which is not, you know, always easy for beginners or not high skill engineered. Uh, and uh, we, we published the first one this summer. So for s really starting projects or people who want to try our software uh, in a nice space, a cloud, secure cloud, um, and they may try and see how it goes uh, before they go to production. So that was our first offer. It's a nice one. And we are about to publish three more offers uh, on Microsoft Azure uh, before Christmas, hopefully. It's in validation somewhere on the other continent. Uh, and they've been really doing a great job with us exploring these new business models. How should we price open source software on a marketplace like Azure or any other one. Uh, and that has been, a, I don't know, hours of discussions, really hours and hours of discussions. What's the value of the software? What's the value of having all this work done with Microsoft team and PrestaShop team together to build the best, and Altaware also, who's in uh, here today, uh, building these, the, the perfect templates so that literally you, you fill the template and uh, you drink a coffee, you come back, 
and your uh, store is ready. So what's the value of that? So it's time, it's speed, um, it's skills, and we're still looking for the right model for the next years to come. I suppose so, yes. Yeah, and I will say that um, we are investing heavily in cloud technologies, although we don't necessarily use the public cloud providers. Um, but we are using OpenStack and Kubernetes and lots of other tools um, as tools to improve the way we utilize the hardware in our data centers and the way we deploy applications to make the deployment of them more elastic and more manageable than they've been in the past. Um, still today, most of our applications are deployed on what um, most people in the tech industry, are computers they've never seen, uh, very, very large machines that don't run Linux and are very, take up lots of space and use lots of power. Um, and they do a great job for what we need them to do, but they are not, they were never designed to be, you know, flexible deployment models like people want today. Um, so that does impact things like reacting to traffic spikes and deployment of new applications and other things. So we have a lot of teams working towards um, moving to these newer models of using flexible deployment and configurable applications and all that kind of thing. And that involves all of the open source cloud technology. You could probably name any of them and we're using them somewhere, so. I, I think I'll speak a little bit with, um, yeah, I, I spent, uh, before I jumped into this non-for-profit foundation game, uh, I spent about five years at Twitter, uh, mostly focused on infrastructure. And um, the, the cloud is great for many things, but uh, you know, once you get to a certain size, I think there's an inflection point where the costs of you using the cloud versus you rolling it on your own, um, it, it becomes cost prohibitive. It's much cheaper to do it yourself, but you know, it's it's a certain point of time where um, you know you, you get there. So like you know, there's a time where we were throwing stuff on uh, S3, uh, you know, which is great and convenient, uh, but eventually over time gets really expensive if you're storing tons of photos, videos, uh, and so on. So, um, you know, it, it was very natural just to kind of roll things uh, in our own data center and the cost savings were, were significant. So I think that's uh, <coughs> something businesses will have to, you know, answer as, you know, more and more companies are becoming software companies. It's a matter of time since they start storing uh, massive amounts of data similar to some of the internet scale companies out there. Um, you know, so, I mean, cloud costs are getting cheaper every day, like Azure, Amazon, and all these folks, and Google are kind of in a like price war uh, occasionally, but in general, it's still uh, yeah, yeah, cheaper to do it on your uh, own, in my opinion, but it's only when you get to a certain scale. Well, the, I love the their price <laughs> war to be you know, stronger. <laughs> Someone has to make money eventually <laughs> off of this, yeah. Yeah, I would have, I have the same, I would have said exactly that. I, at some point of time, it's too costly. Um, there's no way we run a Hadoop cluster on, uh, on one of these public offerings because we're fully leveraging the, the, the hardware anyway. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's a meme that goes around every few weeks on wherever that's supposedly a picture of a little sticker that says there is no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. <laughs> and at the core of it, that's true. So someone has to pay for that hardware and the rack it sits in and the power and the cooling and the network connectivity and everything else, which means the price can't go to zero. Someone will have to pay for it. Um, and so, you know, it can only go so far. You can't have a cloud as an open SSL. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, well, we have talked about the cloud and uh, the impact of the, the cloud business models or perhaps the cloud on business models. Um, perhaps to, to, to finish our panel, um, a word of each of you about the next step. Uh, open source uh, uh, is evolving all the time. Um, in your vision, what's the next challenges for you on this field of open source in the next uh, 12 or 18 months? <laughs> okay. <Come on. coughs> um, I'm not too sure whether it's something, um, I'm not, let's say today I'm not losing any sleep on it. But um, something that um, uh, was mentioned is that there's so many open source projects. Uh, it starts to be the place where you don't know whether something is for real or not, whether something is deprecated or not, uh, whether something is maintained or not, and you're building your, um, your solutions on top of it. When a bug hits and, you and, and it's an open source project and now you need to figure out what happened and it's critical to your business, 
um, it, it, it will start to be harder and harder to reason around it. And I'm not sure that uh, a on one side, you're not going to a tame innovation. You want, you want that to continue. That engine is, it has, has just started and it's not going to stop. But it's got to be a way that we can better reason about what is obsolete and what isn't. And what is deprecated or what isn't, what is supported and what isn't. Today, I don't see it that much in the community. Thank you. We're going to maintain my pressure shop if you need some, <laughs> some e commerce stack. Uh, we've been here for nine years, so. Um, well, as a CEO, it's more a business challenge that uh, we face, I need to face every day, and a uh, clown being one of them, uh, probably one of the main ones because of the price that was mentioned uh, just before. Uh, we know we must go in that direction. Uh, we know we must work on our software uh, with the community, of course, to try and make the software even more uh, efficient in terms of cloud uh, to offer it uh, to every merchant in the world for good price. Don't know how to define a good price and that's going to be a uh, next challenge probably for us. Thank you, Karen. And I would say that uh, I guess we're c talking about the same theme. Um, I'm really hoping to that we continue the efforts to ensure that projects that are fundamental to everyone, not just enterprises, but everybody who's running software anywhere, um, have the support that they need. If they're not a project that can reasonably be turned into a product or a company because it just doesn't make sense for them, then we need support systems to ensure that those things get the resources that they need um, when things occur that the volunteers can't address in a rapid enough fashion. Um, and that's something that many enterprises can you could call it a tax. It's sort of a tax, although it's voluntary, so you can't really call it a tax. But, but, but it's 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 giving back. I mean, you got the software for free for some definition of free, um, but certainly very low cost. Um, that doesn't mean that it's never going to cost you anything. You should actually be contributing back to the health of those projects. I mean, d definitely to second uh, Kevin's point here. I think I think as. Uh, more companies go through their kind of digital transformation, uh, you know, a big part of that is leveraging open source software, right? And, you know, as the software becomes, you know, critical to, you know, these companies' success, like we had this great presentation from Airbus today, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, companies give back enough to, you know, these projects that they depend on because, you know, at the end of the day, in open source, um, there's kind of a saying that uh, you know contribution brings influence. If your company is so dependent on this piece of software, you should contribute so you can control some of that um, you know uh, you know the direction of the software that's so critical for your business. So um, yeah, that's that's my thought to, to kind of close things out. Thank you, thank you all, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Kevin, stay with us.